uh, we'll have a two-part presentation. First of us uh, will be me presenting on our view on what are the main results. And then Lucas will present on how to leverage these results in national discussions. So um, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, I have three slides on this question overall. So um, first of all is that um, in our view, the GST further defined the benchmark for overall ambition, um, which indiv uh, individual NDCs uh, should refer to. Um, yeah, so, um, so the GST decision uh, specified that NDCs uh, should cover all greenhouse gases, should cover all sectors and ca uh, categories, um, which so far was not the case for all NDCs. And it also uh, specifies that NDCs um, should be aligned um, with achieving the 1.5 degree limit. And it also spells out in terms of uh, global aggregate emissions, um, what this uh, means. Um, if we want to limit a global warming to 1.5 degrees with no or limited overshoot based on the uh, IPCC, um latest risk assessment report this requires that global emissions peak before 2025 and that we achieve reductions in the order of 45 43 percent uh, by 2030 and 60 percent um, by 2035 relative to the 2019 baseline and also to reach net zero co2 emissions by 2050. So yeah, one of the one of the difficulties of the GST um, was that it can only address collective progress. Um, but with this year, um, we now at least have a collective benchmark, which can then be used in in the in the assessment um, of the uh, upcoming NDCs in terms of whether collectively they they are on track to actually achieve the objectives of the Paris Agreement. Next slide, please. Um, then secondly, and um, even more importantly, in my view, is that um, the UNFCCC process overall is uh, is increasingly spelling out what climate protection actually means. Um, uh, traditionally, the entire process uh, for decades was focused very much on overall emissions, on defining on or di discussing what would be adequ uh, adequate overall emissions limits globally and nationally um, while it was left to the individual countries on then how to actually achieve those emission reductions um, but um, yeah and wh what we're now seeing is is that um, the process is also discussing how to actually achieve this and i think manjana in one of her papers on on the gst noted um, that that there was wasn't really a clear agreement among parties a shared understanding among parties of what successfully achieving the Paris Agreement would actually mean, and that uh, that the GST could make a contribution uh, towards developing uh, such a shared understanding. And I think we do indeed see this um, also already in the run up to the GST, uh, starting uh, in particular in Glasgow, uh, where the UK government, the UK presidency, set out the objective that the Glasgow COP should consign coal to history um which was achieved in a sense uh and now this has this has been broadened with the agreement um that the world should uh, transition away from fossil fuels and um, so by that um we for the first time actually after more than three decades of uh international negotiations we actually have a cop decision uh, naming uh, what the main problem in climate uh, in combating climate change is um namely the use of fossil fuels and that we need to get over this um and um yeah and the uh in addition to that the decision also says not only what we should transition away from but it also says what we should transition towards uh namely um to triple renewables and double efficiency improvements by 2030 um, the uh, minor, uh, though not so minor point, uh, a weakness here is actually that there's no baseline. So um, this very much comes from the IEA, who had put this in relation to 2022. And earlier decision dra drafts had also based these targets on a 2022 baseline. Um, this baseline is gone in the final version, so it's not as clear as it could have been. 
um, opening potential for gaming, but nonetheless, we at least have the headline targets. It also reiterates the Glasgow decision on coal phase out um, without any further uh, illumination uh, or specification. And it also reiterates the Glasgow decision on fossil subsidies with some further specification, um, bringing in the issue of just transition. Um, and uh, it also highlights the need to reduce non-CO2 emissions, in particular methane by 2030. Though here as well, it's weaker than it could have been. The IEA had specified that we need a reduction of 75%. Here there's only the uh, talk about reduction, but not about by how much. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it's at least the topic is in there. And another first, not so much in the public headline, but also a first in terms of COP decision language, is that we have a uh, um, recognition of the need to halt and reverse deforestation and for forest degradation by 2030. We had already a number of minilateral pledges on this issue, but this is also the first time it's contained in a uh, COP decision, so supported by all parties, if I'm not mistaken. And also a call to transition to sustainable lifestyles, sustainable patterns of consumption, production, and circular economy approaches. Um, yes, and so um, and so. What is the relevance of this? So I personally um, would have wanted a stronger connection uh, to the upcoming NDC process. Uh, for example, one could have imagined that the COP uh, would also specifically call on parties uh, to outline in their NDCs how they are going to contribute to these new, glo new global objectives. So how are individual parties going to contribute to the tripling of renewables, transition from fossils, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this was not possible, but still there is the mandate that parties need to provide information on um, how they have taken the GST results into account in their NDC development. So now there's a hook um, for the domestic political discussion. Um, um, which actors which are interested in, in advancing on climate protection can use um, in the um, political discussions. And also, yeah, it's not very much, I mean, um, we have this COP decision, but that's not the end of the process. It's also in a lot of, in a lot of ways rather the beginning of a discussion, because now obviously we're seeing the battle on, how, okay, how strong is this signal actually? Um, with some parties uh, saying that it signals the end of the fossil fuel age and others saying, no, it's just a menu of options which car uh, parties can pick from. And so uh, this will very much be an issue in the um, coming discussions on how to interpret this. But in any case, it provides a hook for domestic con constituencies um, which they can use um, to demand um, stronger climate action from their respective national governments. Next slide, please. Yeah, then the final slide on this um, part of the presentation. Um, in addition to um, sending overall signals, the GST also contributed to the production of knowledge and learning. Uh, for example, especially in the technical dialogues, a lot of good practice uh the examples were discussed and documented and also opportunities of tackling climate change and so now there's a wealth of material which parties and also other actors can potentially uh, draw on in the further development of national climate policy and parties are also explicitly encouraged in the gst decision to take these good practices and opportunities identified into account yeah, and there's also a, a further process internationally to try to keep the pressure on um, to make sure that parties actually do take the GST results into account, namely the annual global stock taking dialogue starting in June to facilitate the sharing of knowledge and practices on how GST outcomes are informing NDCs. And also parties are invited to present NDCs at a special event under the auspices of the UN Secretary General. So um, the GST decision sets up another, hopefully major moment of political attention, um, which can potentially also be leveraged in national political discussions um, to demand strengthening of climate action. 
So that's it from my side. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. I would like to start with a short anecdote. I was listening to a, a podcast uh, the other day uh, where two very well-established energy and climate journalists based in Washington discussed back and forth. Inter, inter alia, they were also discussing the results of, Co of COP28 and one of them explicitly said, said uh, that he did not see this as a Washington issue. Uh, he saw it as a, as a Washington issue an issue in the sense that obviously the World Bank and IMF and the, the Washington-based institutions will have to engage uh, in, the, in the course of the next year, but not national policy. And I think that is kind of a symptom of the problem that we have, that um, we really need to make sure that the connection um, between the international process of the global stock take and the national policy processes is, is working. Um, and it won't happen by itself. So the logical chain of the Paris Agreement of this wretched mechanism uh, where the global stock take place, yeah, perhaps the, the, the role of the, of the pin that, that avoids the wretched of back, back rolling um, is that obviously we have an output, uh, which is the UAE consensus, uh, Wolfgang, um, gave you an overview of what the, the core messages are from this. And that output is supposed to inform the next round of NDC, so uh, inform effective uh, policy process as, at the national level. The, the, the corresponding uh, sen sentence in, in the Paris Agreement is that the outcome of the global stock take shall inform parties in updating and enhancing in a nationally determined manner their actions and support in accordance with the relevant provisions of the agreement. Action and support is actually broader than just the NDCs, but, but I think we can all agree that the NDCs are at the core of action and support. Um, and finally, the impact is also very precisely defined in the, uh, um, in the Paris Agreement. We need to have revised NDCs for the next um, iteration, representing the highest possible ambition reflecting its common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities in the light of national circumstances. But the question that we set out to, to address in, in our paper, in our discussion paper, is how do we actually ensure that this logical chain will work as intended? Because there is no connection, no automat automatism that connects the output with the outcome stage. Uh, there is no connection between the international process and the national level, uh, uh, national level one. And that is what um, we as a community, policymakers and, and civil society need to work on. So I maybe I start a little bit by, by outlining how we see the NDC process as, as almost a prototypical policy process, right? We have the agenda setting phase. At some point we discuss we need to have an NDC. Um, actually, that was for the first round, arguably um, the result of the Lima COP, where we party were in, parties were invited to prepare their, prepare their intended nationally determined contributions. And then we had several other instances of, of requesting updates um, of their, those yeah, first NDCs. We have the NDC development that is very different on um, uh, depending on the country. Uh, happening on the national level in the EU, basically the EU existing climate and energy policy processes were filtered and put into one document, but there was not a dedicated policy formulation process. In other countries, it was the first time that the country actually started to have a systematic strategic process of developing a, a, a climate, a national climate uh, uh, pledge um, under this NDC uh, formulation process. Then we get into the stage where this, this uh, decision is being taken. The NDC is about to be adopted and then submitted to the, um, to the uh, Paris Agreement and the UNFCC Secretariat. Obviously, it will have to be implemented then. And then we have, we're get, get kind of getting back to the international level where transparency framework is in place to monitor progress um, um, and evaluate the pro progress of implementation. And the global stock take is really linking this then back to the next cycle. Um, again, influencing, yeah, um, summarizing the, 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 the results of all NDCs collectively 
and then informing this towards the next uh, cycle of the process. And this is, I guess, perhaps a relatively straightforward understanding. The next question we asked is where actually does, do the outputs, the results of the global stock take make a difference? Where can they influence this policy process? On the first hand, on the agenda setting, I think one moment is already passed because kind of the immediate uptake of the results of the outcome of Dubai was a good um, opportunity to drive uh, political debate at the national level. But there will be other um, instances in which the agenda for the next round of NDC, the, the beginning of that t cycle um, will happen. It depends on the countries, obviously. And here, I guess, the calls of the uh, the calls of urgency, the calls for ambition of the um, GST results can play into it. In the policy formulation, um, the, the GST results can be very useful. I think particularly the good practice examples that uh, Wolfgang talked about um, could be helpful in, um, in in driving that process. Also, the, the kind of structure that the GST decision gives with a clear um, target for, for renewable energy, with a clear target for uh, energy efficiency, and also kind of that phase-out perspective that's in there. Maybe that's also something that uh, actors can use at the national level to, to advance policy formulation. And finally, in the decision-making, I think the results of the global stock take, the, the, the level, the benchmark for ambition that it sets can be, can be a yardstick for actors at the national level to assess those first drafts of the new NDC and see whether it fits, whether, whether it has to go back to the government for, for more ambition, for more, um, for, for, yeah, for, for, for updates of upgrades uh, before it is actually then passed as the next NDC. How does that happen? Um, for this, we developed a, a, a simple communications model. So this is what we have. We have kind of the, the global stock take outcome and a lot of supporting scientific evidence that's referenced in there, that's, that's um, available in all the submissions and uh, in the synthesis report by the co-chairs of the technical dialogues, co-facilitators. And then we need to somehow get it across, right? We need um, someone to send that message and someone to receive that message, who should be communicating this and who should be a, the, the message addressed to and how uh, do we get the attention of, of the uh, recipients of, of the message. And in the middle, we obviously have the message, what we want to talk about, what should be the objective content uh, of our communication towards informing the NDC cycle. And we, we have a choice. We can choose how to communicate in terms of the tone. Do we want to be the alarmist? Do we want to be very technical? Do we want to be empathetic? This is kind of what tone implies. And we need to find the right channel to get that message through. Um, this channel can be very different from newspaper articles through small circle policy dialogues, through um, all kinds of means to transport the message from the sender to the recipient. And in this paper, we, we discussed this model basically for each of the three stages of the policy uh, process where, um, where, where the GST results may make a difference. In the agenda setting, what should be communicated? I think first and foremost, since the global stock tech only assessed collective progress, it is really important to contextualize country performance that was not with, within the mandate of the global stock check, but it's within the mandate of the civil society and policymakers nationally need to see where their countries are, how they're performing compared to peers and how they should, where they should be. And there's a lot of um, available information from independent uh, sources like the GS GST performance distribution tool, which uh, creates performance distribution charts or, on a variety of indicators and places or gives you the opportunity to place your country in that distribution. That is something that we developed with partners here in this project. There are others like the Climate Action Tractor and the Systems Change Lab that provide detailed information. Who should be the recipient? Since it's about agenda setting, the media plays a crucial role here um, to make um, yeah to make agenda uh, setting effective. I think if it's in the media attention, then policymakers will not get around to publicly also address uh, the next round of ADC. Who should communicate? Our research um, shows that um, we need credible messengers, scientists, 
sometimes also celebrities can help to to advance this uh, as kind of advertisement media and who should be communicated how should be communicated i think here we need really simple messages that stick um that are unified coordinated uh, coordinated between um the community of um of senders if you will um and perhaps a, a more optimistic tone is, is is more favorable than than an alarmist one in the policy formulation uh, stage uh we need to conc yeah, uh, uh, communicate concrete policy proposals and good practices. Um, this can, yeah, it will defend, uh, depend a little bit on, 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 on the, the national context in where you do you talk me, where is the policy formulation actually taking place? Is it in the purview of, um, of, of uh, 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 the parliament where then you talk to staffers and the, the, the leading parliamentarians or is, is it the ministries that are developing it you need to figure that out and then target that audience specifically who should communicate i think technical experts are the right person the right people to to do that and here we we can draw on more complexity and and dive deeper um and, utilize existing formal processes or, or established uh, relationships um, with with uh, with the relevant policymakers. One idea that came up in our research is to to work with this, the idea of citizen assemblies that can be particularly useful. Um, something that was very yeah tried and tested in, in in France with the French citizens assembly. I won't go into this into more detail. And finally in the decision making phase um, yeah we really need to uh, stress that uh, the NDCs uh, need to represent the highest possible level of ambition um, and then um, yeah also highlight that the NDC should explicitly refer to the global stock take um, uh, decision and and pick up those elements like the like the tripling renewable energy goal doubling energy efficiency and spell out how the country NDC um, supports or contributes to those overarching goals. Who should be the recipient of the communication? Again, it depends a lot on who is taking the decision. If it's a, a plebiscite, it's a different form of communication as whether it's just a ministerial or a presidential decision even. Um, this is, we, we couldn't come into more specific uh, discussions because the, this, the, yeah, the, the, the diversity is so large, it will depend on the national uh, progress. And cor correspondingly, the the communication style also depends if if, uh, if if it's a plebiscite you have to have um again media working through media and and we here we have a, an example in our paper where colleagues from this uh, uh, from switzerland really coordinated closely within the scientific community to um align their messages and align their their, their communication towards informing the public in the context of the plebiscite of the swiss climate uh, change law which also um, adopted the decision to uh, achieve net zero um, in 2050 in, in Switzerland. So this style of communication might work in this in, in, in such a setting, but in others uh, you will have to adjust the um, yeah the style and the com uh, the the, the uh, target audience accordingly. That's so far from our framework. I hope it is really um, helpful for for uh, stakeholders and policymakers to to orient their thinking and how to make that su suggestion and make sure that uh, it, it's, it's, it becomes a Washington story um, or a story of your uh, capital as well um, and, and doesn't stay in that international realm. And now I'm really uh, looking forward to the responses by our um, distinguished um, discussants. Thanks.